It was back in uh, 1992 that Disney, Disney produced one of its most popular animated movies of all time. That movie, you might recall, was named Aladdin. And Aladdin, it's this tale that, that tells the story of a young street boy who stumbles across this magical lamp. And when he rubs this magical lamp, out pops this, this energetic, this likable genie. And the genie informs him that he is now entitled to three wishes. Aladdin can, can ask for pretty much anything that he wants. Now, if there's anybody here that hasn't watched the movie, I don't want to spoil it for you, so I won't tell you exactly what it is that Aladdin wishes for. But one thing that you notice is that as the movie goes along, the things that Aladdin chooses, they actually tell us a lot about him. They tell us about the kind of person that he is. They tell us about what drives him, what motivates him, what lives in his heart. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment this morning that you are Aladdin, that this is your movie. You found this lamp. You're entitled to three wishes. You can ask for anything you want. What is it that you would ask for? Anything at all. What would it be? And if someone were to watch your movie from the outside looking in, what would your choices tell them about you? About the type of person that you are? and the kinds of things that live in your heart. Well, in many ways, the passage, the psalm that we're going to look at this morning, is a psalm that gives us a bit of insight into David's life. We learn, a, we learn a lot about him, about what lives in his heart, what motivates him, what drives him. And we also get to see his one greatest singular desire, and that is the desire to dwell with the Lord. And that'll be the central message that we consider for Psalm 27 this morning. And I want to just draw out two specific aspects of this verse to see that the Lord offers protection, but also that the Lord offers hope. So our text opens up with this amazing confession. David says, One thing have I asked the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, this is an amazing text. I wouldn't be surprised if in your homes there are many of you that have this verse up on the wall somewhere, maybe as a screensaver. There's something just profound about it. But I wonder if you've ever thought about what it is specifically that actually makes it beautiful. I mean, we know that the words sound good, but, but what does it actually mean that David wants to desire to dwell in the house of the Lord. Well, if you look simply at your English translation, it, it, it's probably tempting to think that David here is, is focused specifically on the temple. After all, that's exactly what the text says at the end of verse 4. And so the sense that we might get from that perspective is that David has some type of a, a future wish that he's making. He's talking about some type of a future desire to dwell in the temple that his son Solomon would one day build. And we know that that was an amazing piece of architecture. It would have been something to see. But in this case, the English is a little bit misleading, you might say, in the sense that the word temple that's used at the end of verse 4 is a word that the Hebrew also uses for tabernacle. And in the verses 4 and 5, David refers to the house of God, to the dwelling place of God, four times. And each time the word that he uses is a word that is used of the tabernacle. Now, why do I bring that up? To educate you in Hebrew, obviously. So, but the important thing here to understand is that David is not making some type of a future desire. That's not the type of statement it is. He's not having this wishful longing for what is to come. But David here is talking about a present reality. When he's talking about wanting to be in the tabernacle, he's talking about literally wanting to be in the house of God. He wants to be where God was in his time. So what, 
why, you might ask? Like, what, why this desire to want to be in the tabernacle? Well, one thing that, that we don't totally grasp, being so far removed from the time of the Israelites, is that the tabernacle was a place where God's presence was felt in, a, in an incredibly real and almost tangible sort of way. Sometimes we're tempted to think of the tabernacle as if it was this little makeshift worship shelter that was kind of slapped together in the desert. But Exodus 25 tells us that that the tabernacle was, in fact, designed by God. And it was meant to reflect his character. It was meant to reflect his beauty, to reflect his glory. Exodus 26 to 31, they actually tell us that everything about this tabernacle from the poles to the curtains to the altars to the clothes that the priests wore, it had to be made just so. It had to be made by the finest craftsmen because God wanted the place where he dwelt to be incredibly special. He wanted to reflect the very character of who he was so that you could almost sense that he was just right there. If there was one place in all of Israel that you felt surrounded by the security and the safety of God, it was there in the tabernacle, in the presence of God. And so David's desire to want to dwell with the Lord, we have to understand it in many ways as being a desire to want to experience God's presence in a very real way. David is saying that he he wants to be where God is. And the text tells us that this is, in fact, the one thing that he wants. It's the thing that he wants most. And that's because as he reflects on his life, he recognizes that it is God's presence that has has guided him, surrounded him, kept him throughout his life. And we see that right from the opening verse of this psalm. David begins by saying, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David confesses that with God by his side, there's nothing that he will be afraid of. If you look at verse 2 and 3, he says, Even if enemies or armies or war come up against me, still I will say that I will be confident. David finds confidence in the presence and in the protection of God. Now, I wonder sometimes if you or if we as people are ever tempted to think, well, yeah, I mean, of course David could be confident. I mean, look at the guy's life. He was a man that God made king. God gave him tremendous military success. His empire was expanded. He lived in this beautiful palace. He had fabulous wealth. Maybe there are times that you're thinking, well, of my life, or a bit more like David's life, well, then I, then I could be confident. And yet, is that really a, for, a fair portrayal of David's life? If you take a close look at David's life, you begin to realize that here was a man who had his fair share of hardships and trials. So many times that his life is in danger. Right from the very beginning, as a young shepherd boy, they talk about how he He had to go out and face the lions and the bears. Then there's the famous story of of the Philistine giant, Goliath. This giant that keeps the entire Israelite army at bay. And yet David risks his life to go out and fight him. And then when David is a servant in Saul's court, twice Saul tries to take his life. And then David spends years on the run from Saul where he's, he's hiding in caves and mountains spend some time among the enemies, the Philistines. You know, the list of hardships that David faced as a man, it just goes on and on and on. And this short list that I've given you, it only covers the events before he actually became king. In many ways, David, David is a man that had every reason to question God. He was a man that had every reason 
to doubt God's promises, it must have seemed like there were many times that God wasn't protecting him at all. And yet the amazing thing is that with the eyes of faith, David is able to, to look back on his own life and to recognize that even in his darkest and most troubling times, that God was there. And it's something that he's very vocal about. 1 Samuel 17, he talks about how it was God who delivered him from the lion and the bear. God who delivered him from that Philistine giant, Goliath. And when we look at those years that David spent on the run from Saul, it becomes apparent pretty quickly that David, he had a special measure of God's protection. David certainly did not have an easy life. And yet he trusted that God had a plan for his life and that under God's protection, that plan would be brought to completion. No matter what type of hardship, no matter what type of trial that he faced. And that's the confidence that comes up again in verse 5 of this psalm when David says, God will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Now, David wasn't promised an easy life, and he, he certainly didn't get one. And yet, he had the confidence of knowing that he was ultimately safe under the protection of God, in the presence of God. And so that, that's the one place that he desires to be. Now, sometimes... It might seem to be easier to see God's presence in David's life than it is to see it in your own life. I mean, we have the entirety of Scripture. We can read all about David's life. We read all about the plan that God had for him. But I wonder, I wonder when you step back and look at your own life, without the benefit of this external vantage point, what do you see? Do you see God's presence? Do you see his plan? And I think the reality that we have to face is that sometimes it's difficult. There are times that it's difficult, particularly when we're right in the middle of something that's just tremendously heavy. I mean, we might not have enemies or armies or war that comes up against us, but we all face challenges. And those challenges, can t they can make it tough to see the presence of God. Maybe when there's, there's tension between you and your wife or, or you and the kids. Maybe when there's, there's bills piling up at home and, and you have no idea how they're going to get paid. Maybe when you're not sure of how effective the treatments actually are. And so you face this future that's uncertain. I think then if we're honest, then it's tough to say like David, oh, I will be confident. It's tough to say the words that David says. And yet that's why it's important for us to recognize that this confession that David makes, it's not in a psalm that's talking about life where everything is good. But it's in a psalm where David also talks about how hard life can be. And that's something you see particularly in the second half of that psalm. There you've got David in a, in a time of hardship. He's struggling to see God's presence. He says in verses 7 to 12, he things like, Be merciful to me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away. Do not reject me or forsake me. David here, he's clearly in a time of trouble. And then we need to consider, well, what does he do? Well, he trusts. You think about verse 8. David says, God, you have said, seek my face. So your face I will seek. Even in the midst of this hardship, David's saying, I'm not going to rely on me, but I'm going to rely on you. And when we understand it in this sense, we see that David here provides this shining example of what it is to walk by faith, trusting God, trusting his promises. 
And we today, we have every reason to share in David's confidence. We have every reason to be confident in in God and in his promises. Because our confidence is rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. I want you to consider for a moment this morning, who actually really should have had the right to say the words of this psalm? Who really should have been allowed to say, be merciful to me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away. Do not reject me or forsake me. I think we can all agree that if anybody ever had a right to say those words, it would be Jesus Christ. He was the one that actually deserved mercy. He was the one from whom God hid his face. He was the servant that God turned away, the one that was rejected and forsaken. And you have to ask why. Well, all of it so that you and I can know what it is to experience the presence of God. So that you and I can know what it is to experience the the security and the protection that comes with God. It's a protection that, that's not based on an easy life. It's not based on material wealth or about good health. But it's a protection that is based and rooted in the promises of God. A protection that has our ultimate destiny in mind. That's the kind of protection that actually matters. That's the kind of protection that we, we need in this world. It's the kind of protection that offers hope. It's important to recognize as we we consider the aspect of hope that the first half of of this verse, verse 4, or sorry, the second half of verse 4 really builds upon the first. So as we've talked about in the first half, we see David expressing just his desire to be in the presence of God because he recognizes that God has offered him protection. And because of that protection and that faithfulness that he's experienced from God, He says in the second half that he wants to gaze upon the beauty of God. The one leads to the other. Now again, you might ask, well, what does it actually mean to want to gaze upon the beauty of God? Well, perhaps perhaps a looser English translation might, might say something like, David wants to just reflect on the goodness of the Lord. David realizes this this protection and this presence that he's had from God throughout his life. And it just caused him to be captivated. He's kind of mesmerized by the goodness of the Lord. The sense we get from what he's saying is that he's just overwhelmed. And so he expresses it with this love and this adoration by wanting to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. He's amazed by who God is, by what God has done. And so this adoration that David has, it causes him to want to know God more. It causes him to want to seek God more, to walk closer with him. Because we'd be missing the point of this psalm if we think that David here is just wanting to seek God because God gives protection. David's not just seeking God because of what he gets from God. No, David seeks God because he's amazed by God. So he wants to be guided by him. That's a place that he can find hope, something that he can hold on to. He wants to be guided by God. And we see that come through again in in the actual, the last line of this verse, where he says he just wants to inquire in the temple, or he wants to inquire in the tabernacle. It's a theme that comes back again in verse 11, where he says, David or David says, "Teach me your ways, O Lord. Lead me on a level path." The larger picture we get here at the close of this verse is of David being humbled in the presence of God. He realizes that everything he is, everything he's become is totally and completely the work of God. And so as he looks back on his life, he recognizes that that even in his troubling and most difficult times, 
God was there. Because that's who God is, and it's a testament to his faithfulness. And this is a testament that David drives home in verse 10. It's something that doesn't come across as clearly in the English, but I'm not going to give you another Hebrew lesson. But let me just say that the sense that you get here from verse 10 is actually about David tossing out a hypothetical question. It's kind of like David saying, even if my father and mother were to leave me, something that that we agree is almost unthinkable in any culture, even if that were somehow hypothetically to happen, David said, God's love, God's faithfulness, that's something that will never be in doubt. We can't even wrap our minds around the depth of God's love and God's mercy. Instead, what we should do is, like David, actually take the time once in a while to step back, to actually admire the beauty of God, to inquire of him, to reflect on who he is. And so maybe I can ask this morning, do you see the beauty of God? Does it drive you to humility? Does it drive you to praise and to worship that God? I mean, why are you really here each Sunday? Do you love, do you love to be here and to experience the presence of God? Do you recognize and see the beauty in that? It may be, it may well be, that there there are, sorry, that there are those of you here this morning that are struggling to see the beauty of God. Perhaps it's the brokenness of this life that has clouded your vision. It could be that there is grief or that there's anger that has blocked your view. Perhaps you have a battle with demons like depression that seem to be choking out the light. Whatever the case may be, I think we have to be honest about the fact that there are times that we struggle to see the beauty of God. And as long as we're in this broken life, this will continue to be a challenge. But we can take comfort from the fact that we're not alone. Even the Old Testament saints, the saints in the New Testament, they had times that they struggled to see the presence of God. And I think the book of Psalms is is a great example of that. Here you've got all these Psalms by, by different people like David who are crying out. They're struggling to see the beauty of God. They're struggling to see his presence. But the hope that we cling to today is the same hope that they clung to. And that's the fact that God doesn't change. No, our world, our world can make things cloudy from time to time. And there are times that the brokenness of this life does make it hard. But God's character and God's faithfulness And God's person, they remain the same. And so, if you are battling, and if if things seem dark, allow me to urge you not to place your confidence in yourself. Not to search for confidence in in your own emotions, in, in those things that love to sow seeds of doubt but find your confidence in the one who doesn't change. Because that ultimately is a place that you can find hope and security. And that's a place that David found hope and security throughout his life. That's really why David's one singular desire is all about wanting to be in the presence of the one who doesn't change. And God's word is clear. He will be gracious 
to those who seek him. I'm reminded of the words of Proverbs 8, verse 17, where God says, I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently, they find me. Those are the promises of God. Promises that don't change because they're made by a God who doesn't change. So wherever you find yourself today, seek the Lord. Make it your aim to discover who he is, to discover what he's done for you in Christ Jesus. And begin to learn what it is to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Make that, make that your hope. And that's not to say that all your problems in this life suddenly disappear. I think there are those of you here this morning who know all too well what it is to face difficulty and hardship. You know what it is to be called down a road where God in his wisdom provides obstacles. And sometimes you just don't know why. And yet, it all comes back to the fact that our confidence and our hope, it's not based in our circumstances, it's not based in us, but it is based on God. It's based on who He is. God doesn't promise a life of health, wealth, and prosperity. But this is what God does promise. God promises that those who place their faith in him, who trust him, who love him, who look to his son, Jesus Christ, God promises that they will know what it is to dwell in the house of the Lord. God promises that a day is coming when they will know in the most unthinkable way what it is to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to live in his presence. Those, those are the promises of God. Those are promises that actually offer hope. And those are promises that allow us to say with David that I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait. For the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. Amen.